it feels like we're on the verge of starting this new chapter, but every time we try to turn the page, somehow the numbers get worse. As a chief executive who's in charge of these thousands of employees, how concerned are you about this? Do you think folks are trying to return to, to work too soon? Honestly, I have no idea. I mean, I think that's uh, that's part of the frustration of this conversation. I've been talking to a lot of CEOs, a lot of different companies, different industries. You know, obviously, spend more time with the uh, with the software CEOs, but uh, no one really knows. And and there's some strong opinions on some aspects of what happens when we do go back. Um, but in my staff meeting, uh, our head of people, Nadia Rawlinson, had this really important distinction, which I think is kind of critical for how we think about it because we were going in circles, going back and forth and back and forth. And she said, when we talk about what's gonna be different in the future, are we talking about different from today or are we talking about different from February, 2020? And I think most people tend to go uh, back to you know, 13, 14 months ago and imagine what would be different from then rather than thinking about where we are today. And if you think about it in that way, I think it's a totally different picture. So your future forum research, you've got this think tank called Future Forum, which is focused on the future of work. You found that nine out of 10 workers don't want to return to the office full time. What should we take away from that? That people want flexibility. I mean, I think there's a huge mix of emotions and, and um, a lot of that's driven by the fact that there's the pandemic is still ongoing and people are stressed about their health. And a lot of the regular kind of amenities of life have been taken away. You can't go to the restaurant, you can't get a massage or to get your nails done or when you imagine those things starting to change, I think people's emotional state starts to change. But many companies like ours have, you know, 30% of our employees, 30% plus started post-pandemic. So many companies like us have hired a lot of people, um, have allowed people to move, and you can't unscramble that egg. But I think we also realized, despite the fact that we all thought it was impossible, productivity remained high over the course of this year for many organizations. And there's this real desire to get together with people. Um, but that doesn't mean that... Uh, that we're going to be going back nine to five. And I don't think that's ever going to happen, honestly. So what does that mean for your workforce? Of course, uh, we know Slack, you've agreed to sell the company to Salesforce, mm -hmm. biggest tech deal of the last year. Salesforce has uh, reopening its tower, the big Salesforce tower in May with limited capacity. What's your plan for Slack employees? What's your plan for yourself? How often will you be going back to the office? I think it's a really good question to think about where the, the leaders are going to be. So we've done some limited office um, openings and kind of experiments in places like uh, Australia and, and Japan, where it's a you know, bit of a different situation. But we haven't been able to keep an office open for, for very long before the policies change. I think for myself, given the evidence that our whole team continue to be productive, I want the flexibility. I think there's a lot of people who are in that position. You know, while there's a lot of young people early in their career who want to get back to the office as part of their social life, there's a lot of people who have families and they like the lack of a commute. They like being able to spend a little bit more time with their kids. So people are all over the place, but the idea that we're gonna count the number of days that we go back into the office each week, I think is wrong headed. The real question is the extent to which organizations are digital first, because the fact that we managed to do this without our physical offices uh, means that we're able to shift the, the ways in which people uh, collaborate, the ways in which people communicate, the ways in which like, productivity actually happens. I don't think any CEO would trade software for offices, but we get to kind of welcome offices back into the mix of how we relate to one another and kind of the tool set that's available for us to uh, get stuff done. So companies like Coinbase have gone all remote forever. There's then the hybrid approach. And then there's companies like Netflix. We, we've spoken about this. Reed Hastings, the, the co-CEO, telling me he wants people back when, when they can be back. What does this sort of hybrid world mean for the recruiting of tech talent? Like, how hard does that change the war for the, the great people that you want to recruit? Yeah, that's, I think, a really interesting question. And we talk about Netflix or, or Goldman Sachs. The market's going to decide this one, just like the market decides compensation. So uh, some organizations are going to be offering people, you know, 100 percent remote, and some people won't like that. Some people will want to have an office. Others are going to want the flexibility, and I think that uh, everyone likes options. Options sell for money. So if you have the option, you have the ability to say, you know, I have sick parents. I want to go back east for three months, or I want to live in Tahoe in January and February. If that's kind of considered a perk or one of the, the uh, deciding factors in how people take their jobs, then 
I think that's going to decide it for us, regardless of what CEOs want. So uh, let's talk then about how this impacts the product. And obviously, Slack has helped keep so many people connected at this time. How do all of these changes, or maybe there's less change, maybe there's going to be less change than we think, how will that impact usage of the product? How much we're spending time on chat apps or video collaboration platforms? Yeah, I think it's our focus uh, over the last couple of months has been what both as a company, uh, how we operate internally, and also um, as the developers or product that many people use, how can we take things that today must be synchronous uh, and make them asynchronous? And the fancy word, but we just mean, when can we kind of decouple people's time to give them some additional flexibility? You know, some people work better in the morning and some people work better in the evening. And obviously everyone's kind of physically exhausted with the eight hours of video meetings. So I don't mean that we eliminate work or even reduce the number of hours necessarily, but make it possible for people to collaborate without having to be on a call at the same time. And we have a lot of exciting stuff coming there, uh, a feature called Huddles, which is always on audio uh, that allows for more kind of serendipitous or spontaneous conversations, but also trying to find ways to explicitly kind of recreate the value of a meeting, but without requiring that everyone be there at the same time. All right, and just last quick question, Stuart, but before we had to break, obviously we're still waiting for the uh, Salesforce deal to close. Can you give us any updates on where that stands? Unfortunately, I can't. So we're, we're still just uh, kind of standing by and waiting. We're um, happy to work with the regulators and kind of go through the process. Um, so no update, unfortunately, but um, I think both Salesforce and us have always been committed to an open ecosystem and kind of interoperability. And I think that will um, make it easy for people to make a decision.